These are seven of the best PlayStation games that you should play right now. Some of the latest and greatest releases for the PlayStation 5 that truly show the capabilities of the next generation consoles. First up, let's talk about Avatar Frontiers of Pandora. This is by far one of the most anticipated games for me personally that was released this year. I didn't really see too much hype surrounding this title like you do with things like Spider-Man 2, God of War, all those types of games. And to be honest, I think it sort of flew a little bit under the radar. It was just sort of like, oh, there's an Avatar game coming out. Some people knew about it, some people didn't. There was some YouTubers talking about it. There was some people getting early access to it. But, but other than that, I just, I didn't see that much hype for it. And I think a lot of gamers actually don't even know that this game exists. And it's actually completely different to what you would first expect. You would assume this is a third person game, like a sort of traditional Avatar game in the past, but it's actually an FPS shooter. Based off of the film series, this is an open world Ubisoft game that is an FPS action adventure, and the entire game can be played in co-op with a friend, which I think is just super cool. It's based 15 years after the first movie, and the gameplay and graphics look absolutely insane. Now, this is a story game with typical Ubisoft gameplay elements. You've got things that you will most commonly see in things like Far Cry, like those towers to unlock areas of the maps, loads of different side quests, very similar. Anything you've seen in a Ubisoft game before, it's in this one. It's heavily inspired by Far Cry and Assassin's Creed, but obviously it's a first person shooter just like Far Cry. I think the FPS element of this game is incredibly unique. I, I would have, like I said earlier, expected to be a third person sort of perspective style game, but the FPS just makes it a little bit more immersive, a little bit more personal, a bit more personability when it comes to the whole story element, because obviously this is, a, this is a story player game. This makes it feel just a little bit more immersive that's a very overused word but if that makes sense I feel like if you were playing this in third person you wouldn't really feel the same aura around the environments you know, these incredibly beautiful luscious environments that they've created that look just like the movie and you get a real sense of scale having the fps perspective and i think it was the great choice creatively for this game now the game isn't 100 percent first person when you do fly the various dragons what, what are they even called in the, in the in the movie when you fly the various animals uh, those do then suddenly go to third person like call of duty when you play in warzone you hop in a car it goes into third person mode or on a quad bike it goes third person mode so you can just see your environment a little bit easier and navigate the map the exact same premise here when you're flying around it will go third person and it looks a little bit like war thunder actually when you're shooting uh, the people out of the sky next up we've got a recently released title which is the last of us part two for the ps5 remaster now obviously the last of us part two came out on the ps4 and they did have like a little 200 megabyte update for the PS5 version that made a little bit of a difference to the performance. But now they've got a native version that's been remastered for the next generation consoles. Now, if you already own The Last of Us Part 2, it will be around a $10 upgrade just to get this new enhanced version, very similar to what they did with The Last of Us Part 1. But this time, there's some new game modes and different maps and so on that's actually been added. Now, when they remastered The Last of Us Part 1, that had quite significant upgrades. It was a PS3, PS4 game that now had completely new graphics, but also new physics. They changed the whole character models to match how the characters felt in Last of Us Part 2, a little bit more nimble and agile. So there's quite a lot of changes, I would say, with that upgrade. It wasn't just a graphics patch, which is kind of what you've got here with The Last of Us Part 2. Anyways, to digress, The Last of Us Part 2 does have some new modes that you don't get on the older version. So for your $10, you'll get graphical enhancements, you'll get some new lost levels. Of course, there'll be full DualSense integration with the adaptive triggers, which I do think will be quite cool. There's some new outfits, and also two things that the fans are gonna get pretty hyped about. Guitar free play, so you can basically play the guitar as Joel in free play, which I think is quite cool. This, this was a fun little mini game. In the old, in the old, in the original title, when you would basically just do certain missions, you, the, the guitar would be playable, like early on in the first hour or so. But this is now just guitar free play, so I think people will have a lot of fun with this, doing uh, covers on the internet of random uh, songs inside of The Last of Us. But also, there's the new exclusive roguelike survival mode. This is kind of like a horde style mode that I've seen in games such as Gears of War, where you just have waves of enemies rushing at you, and you unlock various different rewards and there's a leaderboard as well next up we've got another playstation classic but from the og ps1 and ps2 and that is the new tomb raider remastered collection now some of the younger viewers may only know tomb raider from the reboot which is a great bunch of games i enjoyed all of those different games however my brothers that are around 10 to 15 years older than me will know this version of tomb raider from tomb raider 1 2 and 3. now that version of lara croft looks significantly different to the version that we played as 
but by no means the games are still absolute bangers. And considering this bundle only costs you around $24 for three OG nostalgic classic games, I don't think that's too bad. Now this will be releasing in February 2024, so it is a future title on this list. But with increase in resolution, I guess you could claim better graphics. It probably looks better than it did on the PS2, but by modern standards, it looks a bit a bit bad. It's kind of in the similar style of that GTA Trilogy remaster. They've taken some old classic PlayStation 2 games, made them look sexy and a little bit newer, but they still retain what makes them classic. They've got that old feel, they're still a little bit clunky, they've got the old graphic style, just enhanced so it fits onto a modern television and looks a little bit better. Looks how you sort of remember it in your head. Sometimes when you go back to these old games on an old console, you're like, wow, this used to run at like 20 FPS and it kind of kills your childhood nostalgia. Whereas these will run at, you know, 60 FPS, great resolution, graphics will look kind of okay and it won't uh, tarnish your entire childhood. While we're on the topic of my childhood, Let's take a look at Spider-Man. Now, Spider-Man was one of my favorite superheroes as a kid. I used to dress up as him all the time. <laughs> I was I was literally Tom Holland before Tom Holland running around the living room. This wouldn't be a PS5 list if we didn't talk about the latest game, Spider-Man 2. This is one of the biggest game releases of the year. It's got special edition consoles, special edition controllers. Sony's gone to town promoting this game. Collector's edition as well with that crazy statue. Now, Spider-Man 2 is probably one of the best PlayStation 5 games ever made. I think it's a fantastic story game. It's got some great improvements over like the old Spider-Man, uh, like the original one that was on the PS4. The characters in combat has been enhanced greatly. The graphics obviously look insane. And with it being a PS5 only title, it fully leverages the next generation power. Like that first mission alone, when you play the first hour of the game, the big fight you have with uh, the Sandman dude, you can see how the that, that next generation level loading of the NVMe SSD, the map is just so big and there's so much going on without any loading screens. It's just so seamless. It really showcases the, the power of the speed of the, the, not even the graphical capabilities, just the speed of that SSD drive, being able to load all these sequences in very fast. The scope of the missions is huge on this new version. They feel much less linear compared to the PS4 with the original Spider-Man game. And to be brutally honest, I haven't seen too many complaints about Spider-Man 2 across the community. It seems very positive across the board. I think it's got around four and a half stars out of five on the PlayStation Store, and that's with millions and millions of reviews. So pretty solid choice. Another pretty decent choice is God of War Ragnarok, which was another huge PlayStation 5 game, one of the biggest PS5 games to release before Spider-Man, I would say, took that throne. God of War Ragnarok is a single player game that I think is perfect to play at this time of year in winter, sort of around Christmas, the whole start of the game's in snow. So it's very festive. Then of you, as of course, as you progress through the game, you go into other environments that are a bit more sandy and so on. But it's a very cozy game, God of War Ragnarok. You've got that father-son relationship, you're going out and about, you're surviving. There's just something about it that feels great. My only complaint with God of War Ragnarok is the gameplay. Like Spider-Man, you know, it's got a little bit more you're still spamming and jumping around, but you've got like all the skill tree and stuff like that. So you could sort of change your abilities quite a bit. Whereas God of War Ragnarok, there's other things you can unlock in the skill tree. But fundamentally, you're just spamming RT, like heavy attack, heavy attack. You're doing a few combos here and there, throw the axe. But the gameplay can get a little bit rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. Roll, hit, 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 roll, hit, 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 roll. Which uh, I meant I got a little bit bored after I think I played maybe four hours, five hours. And then I sort of didn't revisit it. But from a storyline perspective, it was absolutely solid. I loved the story. I loved the direction the story was developing. And I did truly get invested in all of the characters. And I wasn't a huge God of War fan. It wasn't like I'd played all the past titles to love this. This was really my first one. I'd played the one on the PS4 a little bit. But this was my first real investment into the God of War franchise. And I think they did a great job of having people understand the story, even if you've never played this title before. Because right at the start, it does a super cool recap of like previously in God of War. And it just helps you sort of uh, get invested in the storyline and not feel like you've missed out on years of gaming. Next up, we've got something a little bit more casual and also that does have multiplayer. And that is Gran Turismo 7. This is one of the best racing games that you can play on console. I think it does things a little bit better than Forza. I love Forza. You've got Forza Horizon, like the free roam stuff, which is all right. You've got Forza Motorsports, which used to be by far my favorite franchise for racing games, like Forza 3, Forza 4, uh, Forza 5 was okay. And then I sort of fell off from them from that point. But Gran Turismo, I think, has a higher level of maturity when it comes to how it's structured as a racing game. A lot of the times racing games can be deemed a bit kiddie, like, oh, it's, I've got a racing game, Peggy 3, you know, my mom doesn't let me play GTA because it's got guns in it. So I play Forza or I play <laughs> Gran Turismo. But there's something about Gran Turismo that just, uh, it retains everything you love about racing, but 
it has it in a way where even if you're a little bit older, you can still play it for hours on end and not sort of get bored. Problem with Forza is you have them wheel spins. So you're like, unlock stuff like this. You get a Bugatti after like an hour of playing and you're like, oh, this is crap. So it's, you sort of run out of thing. My favorite thing about Gran Turismo is the used car market element of it. So you've got the single player, you do all the different licenses. You've got to do training as well to unlock different licenses, which I think is quite fun. But then also there's this used car market where cars will randomly drop at different prices. You can get like a, a Porsche for an absolute bargain. And, 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 it, and it has like its own ecosystem that, that consistently changes and is dictated, I think by the players, I think it is, from the top of my head, if I remember right. But it's super cool. You can go get like a car with a load of miles on and then you can like upgrade it, get it cleaned up. Da -da 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 -da. I love that. But then as well, it also has its multiplayer element, which has, you know, party play where you can just play with some friends. But also it's got the whole uh, GT Academy and that type of stuff where you can competitively race online against other people. And of course, if you've seen the movie, uh, you know, you can maybe race a real car in one day if, if you progress through all of the things. You know, it's it's super cool. All the different approaches you can have depending on how serious and competitive you want to be when it comes to racing. Other thing that I love about it, it graphically looks amazing. It works so well with the PSVR 2. This is one of the easiest racing games to set up with a VR headset. You just plug it into the console and that's it. You're like driving a car in virtual reality. Whereas you know, on the PC, getting VR set up can sometimes be a little bit frustrating and an arduous task. So I think it's ease of use for racing across the board of whatever your skill level is, is brilliant. Hogwarts Legacy. This game launched at the start of 2023 and the hype for this title was off scale. People were going crazy for a bit of Harry Potter. Now, a lot of people say I look a bit like Harry Potter just because I'm British and I've got glasses. Um, they all say I look like Tom Holland. You got to choose, guys. Who, who, who is it? Who is it? Either way, Hogwarts Legacy, I think, is one of the best games to release this year. I think the hype for it has died off a little bit. It is a single player game, which makes it a little bit one dimensional. You know, you, a lot of people like multiplayer. I think it would have been great if it had co-op because I'd have played it with uh, through a few mates. But I played a good 15, 20 hours, I think, of this title and thoroughly enjoyed every single minute of it. I love the character progression, the skill tree, the exploration of Hogwarts. And I wasn't really a huge Harry Potter fan. I'd watched a few movies here and there. But after playing this game, I finally understood like how Hogwarts worked, the, its layout, where the, all the villages were in relation to it. It was a super cool insight if you are a fan of the films, just to see the layout of this world and how it all links together. It was superb having the freedom to explore an open world Harry Potter game without any restrictions, really. You could go wherever you like, you could fly various different animals, you could whiz around on your little stick. And I think every element of this game was just knocked out of the park. It was just true perfection, great single player game, great story and so many different activities that you could pursue. And again, if you're watching this video in sort of winter time, it's superb for Christmas vibes because you've got the snow, you've got the changing seasons, it's all cozy because it's Harry Potter. And if you play this on the PS5, it has got features for the DualSense controller, which just makes it so much better than when you play it on PC and Xbox. I also have a play save of this on the PC where again, because you can choose different houses with the sorting hat, it does have a good element of replayability, playing it from different perspectives, being evil, being good, stuff like that. But the PS5 version of this is the best, super easy to play, you just boot it up, it looks great in 4K HDR, and the controller just makes it all feel super cool when you're spamming all the magic buttons. Now, of course, these are some of the best PS5 games that you can play right now, but if you want to see me check out some of the cheapest PS5 games, if you're maybe gaming on a budget, you should check out this video next, and also subscribe to the channel for more videos just like this one.